Hello, welcome to CAT 109, the politics, history, and ethics of the cannabis industry. Today we're going to be looking at the ancient history of medical cannabis, um, specifically from about 10,000 BCE to the beginning of the Roman Empire um, in the first, second, third centuries um, after uh, the year zero. Before so, let's talk about the years. Now, this is something that people always get confused, and I understand it, so I always like to review it. So, the common designation for the year before the year zero is BCE, before the Common Era. We don't tend to use BC by itself anymore because, you know, there are a lot of Christians who believe in Christ, but there's also a whole pile of other people um, somewhere in the neighborhood of four or five billion who don't actually include Christ in their religious or historical references. So, for the neutral, we're going to use BCE. After the year zero, historians designate this as CE or the Common Era, and it is often also referred to as AD, which is the whole Annus Domini, the year of the Lord. So, again, not everyone is a follower of Christ, and as such, we're going to keep this um, fairly neutral. Also, remember that year zero to year 99 counts as the first century. The year we live in, in 2019, but it is the 21st century. The reverse is also true. From 99 BCE to 1 BCE, that counts as the first century BCE. So, what you do is you take the year, you add 1 to get to the correct century if you get confused. So, the um, timeline that I have listed here goes into what happened pre the year zero and post the year zero. So we're going to look at the ancient times and that's pretty much everything from a thousand BCE and earlier. Uh, lightly touching on a little Hellenistic and Roman era usage of cannabis and that takes us up to essentially the year zero. And we're going to then next week talk about the medieval renaissance and modern times followed by just looking at the Americas per se and exactly what happened in the United States. So we got a lot of fun stuff to talk about. I know you're excited so let's move forward. So just kind of give you an idea of what we're looking at in terms of historical migration patterns. 70,000 years ago Homo sapiens started to spread outside of Africa. So if you look at Africa, which is all the way over on the right, you're going to see that they have a little designation called Adam over there on the east coast of Africa. And that's where they believe mankind really started to coalesce, create um, communities. And then from there, there was a wide range of migration patterns. By 10,000 BCE, mankind had pretty much dispersed around the world keeping in mind that 10,000 BCE is also when the last Ice Age ended and um, as those Ice Age uh, structures or, or land masses started to melt, you started to see, uh, for example, the distance between Asia and Russia become much wider coming into North America. So the vast majority of people who emigrated to the Americas from Asia and Siberia um, did so 10,000 years ago and then that ice bridge fell apart. So no more ice bridge. So when we think of Native Americans, they're really uh, descendants of uh, the Siberian and Asian emigrants who came across 10,000 years ago. So cool, isn't it? All human species today come from this species of Homo sapien, although recent DNA testing has proved that most Europeans carry some Neanderthal in them. And it's basically just two different hominids or human-like um, characters or individuals who meet and fall in love and realize that one is a Homo sapien and the other one is actually a Neanderthal. 
And of course, what happens over time is that the sheer number of Homo sapiens outdistance the number of Neanderthals, and the Neanderthals were extinct 35,000 years ago. However, all of us who came from the European side of the world probably have a little bit of Neanderthal still inside of us. So there you go. Moving on to the next major moment, we have the Neolithic or New Stone Age, which was approximately 10,000 BCE, and as I said, it was the end of the last Ice Age, to 4,000 BCE. And really what happened was a revolution in lifestyle because they were able to harness the understanding of agriculture. Systematic farming gave humans greater control over their environment. So instead of hunting and gathering and moving from place to place, they now had settled communities. And this is how civilization that emerged after 4000 BCE really grew was that now they could control their food source. So from 7000 to 8000 BCE in several areas we see people beginning to emerge and build large civilizations and these included areas in China, India, the Middle East with Egypt and Sumeria which is right in Mes um, Iraq, modern day Iraq. In those days it was um, you might have heard of the name of the area called Mesopotamia. So you start to see these cultures emerging and creating a civilization for the first time in recorded history or any history. Um, this meant that they could stockpile their food and begin to trade the excess with other communities. And again, this is really where we see civilization beginning and taking off to where we are today. So it's really, if you think that the Earth is 14 billion years and 6 billion years in terms of its present shape, and we've only been around for 13 or 14,000 years as a society or a civilization, that's pretty intense when you think about it. So let's talk about cannabis. Cannabis came from what we call Central Asia, Mongolia, Southern Siberia. So when you are thinking of um, where it was being grown, we're looking at one of the first developed civilizations, which of course was in China. The Chinese used cannabis for fiber and rope making. Archaeologists discovered a Stone Age village on the island of Taiwan, which dates to 10,000 years ago, and on the pottery shards they found imprinted hemp cord as decoration. Among the tools found included a tool for cutting hemp fibers from their base. So over here on the right I have a little map so you can see Mongolia is south of Russia, nor part of China, and um, there is a decorative urn on the other, on to the right of that item. And again, you can, if you look at it closely, you can see some of the hemp cordage um, impression because the only thing that separates us from the animal kingdom is our ability to accessorize. And if you know what movie I'm talking about, kudos to you. Okay, so let's talk about the Yang Shao culture. Um, the earliest cultural evidence of cannabis comes from the oldest known Neolithic culture in China, the Yangshao, who appeared along the Yellow River Valley. And you'll notice that all of these major civilizations that emerged around the same time all emerged around large bodies of water because they needed that water to manage and control their agricultural output. From 5000 to 3000 BCE, the economic driver of the Yangshao was cannabis. And archaeological evidence shows that they wore hemp clothing, wove hemp, and produced hemp pottery. Hemp fibers were also used to produce sails and ropes. So what you're seeing here is that a plant defined this early culture because it was able to do so many different things. 
So the ancient Chinese used every part of the cannabis plant. They used the root for medicine, the stem for textiles, rope, and clothing. The fibers served as bowstrings for the bow and arrows. Hemp was used as paper, eventually replacing papyrus. The leaves and flowers for intoxication and medicine. And the seeds for food and oil. Cannabis seeds were also one of the grains of early China and ancient tombs of the Chinese had sacrificial vessels filled with hemp for the afterlife. So if you needed some hemp after you died, it was going with you to the next stage of existence. Here's some cannabis terms from antiquity. I just like these because so many of them are still fairly um, well represented. So of course we have marijuana and marijuana, hemp, hashish, dama, daga, bong, which is an Indian drink made from the leaves, charas, ganja, and loco weed. The ancient Chinese symbol for hemp is the word ma. And there is the picture of it if you have an overwhelming desire to get a tattoo of it. The part beneath and to the right of the straight lines represent the hemp fibers. The horizontal and vertical line represent the home. So in symbolic writing, what you're seeing here is hemp and home combined. Interesting, isn't it? Emperor Shen Nung recorded its palliative effects. This is so important because this is the first time, you know, we have a government saying, here is a medication or here's a plant that provides a lot of um, healing impact. So researchers believe that at some point farmers use the hemp seed as food which alerted them to the pharmacologic properties inherent in cannabis. Starting from about 2900 BCE, or 5,000 years ago, cannabis was a common medicine used in China. The first recorded use of cannabis as a medicinal drug occurred in 2737 BCE by the Chinese Emperor Shen Yong. He documented the drug's effectiveness in treating the pains of rheumatism and gout in his writings called Pen Sao, which was a reference of herbal remedies. And it was a thousand years beyond that, in 1500 BCE, that cannabis was written into the Riya Chinese Pharmacopoeia. And basically what that means is essential herbs for life. And, you know, based on what we've already talked about, we do know that the Chinese use a lot of herbal remedies in addition to our current modern pharmaceuticals. So the Riya refers to cannabis as Ma. The Chinese believe Ma possess both the yin and the yang dualism qualities. The yin symbolize the weak, passive, and feminine influence. Yang symbolize the strong, active, masculine force. When these forces are in balance, a person is healthy. When one force dominates, the body is unhealthy. According to Shen Yang, it was more important to grow the female part of the cannabis plant because of its medicinal qualities. Remember that we had discussed last week that um, male plants grow very, very good, strong hemp. And female plants grow very good, high-level THC buds. Balancing the yin and the yang required ingestion of resinous cannabis, especially for menstrual fatigue. During early civilization, Chinese medicine men, shamans, which was the name that you saw um, in the northern parts, such as Siberia, which is west, which is east of Russia, and doctors believe that there was a demon responsible for one's illness. To remedy an illness, the doctor must drive the demon from the patient. The ancient Chinese remedies included cannabis stalks with snake carvings embedded on the stalks. The doctor would stand over the patient 
and then the doctor would hit the bed with the stalks, commanding the demon to leave. Interestingly, this practice of hitting the bed with cannabis stalks lasted until the Middle Ages, up until about the 1300s. So that's a very interesting concept that if you beat the bed, you could beat the, be the demon out of the person. We should try that one of these days. In the second century, the Chinese surgeon Hua Tu, circa 175 AD, wrote about using cannabis as an anesthetic. He created a powder from the drink, mixed it with wine for the patient to drink before surgery, and he called it Me O, or Ma O, not Mayo. And there's a picture of Hu Tao, who is supposedly working on a patient um, conducting surgery having given him this anesthetic. So in 657 the Tang Dynasty commissioned an official version of the Pharmacopoeia. Written by more than 20 doctors it was published two years later and became the world's first official Pharmacopoeia. The West would not catch up for centuries. The newly revised canon of Materia Medica is also called Tang Bengkao, or Tang Materia Medica, or Yingong Bengkao. Some of the recommended uses included the root of the plant will help remove blood clots. The juice can help get rid of, what's that? Tapeworm. And prevent hair loss, ease constipation, and ease rheumatism. So, despite not having the ability to utilize all the modern technology that doctors have today, they were able to figure out specific things that cannabis could be used for that would benefit the patient, theoretically easing their symptoms. There's also a lot of evidence about ritualized cannabis use. It was used in shamanistic activities to commute with the spirit world, believing that the resinous female flowering heads were the sources and revelations. In June 2019, so literally not long ago, archaeologists working in the Pamir Mountains excavated tombs, discovered a brassiere, which you will see on the right hand side. It's kind of like a modern incense burner. And the residue was tested and it discovered it contained very high levels of THC. Pretty cool. Researchers have suggested that cannabis was used to honor the dead in ritualized ceremonies. So again, you know, throwing the resinous flowers or seeds onto burning coals is going to release the fumes that will ultimately bind to the receptors in your brain. They didn't understand any of this, but they knew that it worked and it did something. So during the rise of the religion known as Taoism around 600 BCE, marijuana intoxication was demonized as against nature since it altered the mind and body. It did not have enough yang and the yin would weaken the person. So yeah, a thousand years before, Medical cannabis was the rage, but again, th times change, things change, all of those things change. And as you will see, over time, the same people who were against it are going to be the same people who are now for it. So just kind of bear with us on that one. Taoism is a system of beliefs, attitudes, practices set towards the service of living a person's nature, who you are, your authentic self. Taoism teaches that through experiencing the joy and humility of living, you will express your authentic nature. 700 years later, Taoists incorporated magic into their beliefs and would add the cannabis seeds to their incense burners to commune with the spirit world. So, you know, 600 years before Christ, you're seeing a movement against cannabis. 700 years later, it becomes part of the religious 
um, rituals that people engage in to feel closer to God. Cannabis in Chinese medicine is still prevalent and it is one of the 50 fundamental herbs used in traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, uses include pain relief for menstrual disorder, pain relief for wounds, nervous disorders, i.e. anxiety, postpartum difficulties, that's after you have a baby and your hormones are all out of whack, a laxative, a diuretic, it will ease vomiting and stomach cramps, and it'll ease the sting of scorpions. So I know we get a lot of scorpions in the Mid-Atlantic, but uh, we don't. Um, but it's good to know. And prevent or control hair loss. Can't guarantee anything on that one, my friends, but, you know, your mileage may, merit, may vary. So we're going to jump from China to now Egypt. Ancient Egyptians understood the medical uses for cannabis almost 4,000 years ago. The following documents reference medical cannabis. So these are papyruses and the era in which they were written. So the Remesium III papyrus, written around 1700 BCE, the Ebers papyrus, 1550 BCE, and the Berlin papyrus, 1300 BCE. I have a picture of the Ebers papyrus, um, and it's named after the guy who bought it. So it's not rele relevant to what Egyptians um, believe. It's just some guy who bought it and gave it to the University of Leipzig. Um, so we see cannabis being written about in these documents to treat pain, inflammation, and sore eyes. It was also used in suppository form as a relief from hemorrhoids. Egyptian women were encouraged to use it to help with depression. So, you know, when we're looking at these things, and even though today we still talk about how, you know, people don't discuss depression like they used to, the reality is, give or take, we have a situation where we can point to specific references in ancient papyri that say people suffered from depression. So it's not a modern disease. It's just we're looking at it more nowadays, and we're looking at it differently. So when the mummy of Pharaoh Ramses II was discovered in 1881, his remains contained trace evidence of cannabis. Since that time, many mummies have shown similar trace levels of cannabis in their remains. Seashot, the ancient goddess of wisdom, is usually depicted with a colorful cannabis leaf over her head. And there she is on the right-hand side. So what we see here is that those people who were using cannabis were at the very top echelon of society and since it also was something that manifested in the gods it was probably fairly prevalent amongst the population again we're working with limited written documentation so a lot of this is um, hypothesized and the more information we discover through archaeology the more likely we are to find something that will validate it for sure down the road so we're going to jump to India next and a little historical context so as a civilization like I said it emerged after the Ice Age around 8000 BCE and it has a very long history of being invaded conquered and then invaded again. In 2000 BCE, the Aryans, who were blue-eyed, light-skinned individuals from the area of modern-day Siberia, which is the western part, or I'm sorry, the eastern part of Russia, invaded India, a land filled with dark-skinned, dark-eyed inhabitants. They really liked it there, so much so that they stayed and intermarried with the locals and helped develop an early writing system called Sanskrit. So the Aryans, and you may remember the reference that um, Hitler often made to them, um, the Aryans are essentially Russians, 
from the Siberian area who said, I am tired of being cold. We're going south and we're going to find somewhere warm. And they did. Now, the Aryans also invaded present-day Iran, in case you saw a connection with the name. So, Iranians are also descendants of these um, people from, essentially, Russia. The Four Vedas is a set of holy books, and it tells the stories of how the Aryans ended up in India. It also tells the story of their god, Shiva, who brought the marijuana plant down from the Himalayas for mankind's use and pleasure. So, as you can deduce, the Indians were pretty cool with the whole concept of cannabis. According to the Vedas, cannabis was one of the five sacred plants and a guardian angel lived in its leaves. The Vedas call cannabis a source of happiness, a joy giver, a liberator that was compassionately given to humans to help us attain delight and lose fear. The most common method of ingestion was to drink bong, an Indian drink made from the leaves. During the Middle Ages, Indian soldiers often took a drink of bong before entering battle, just as Westerners will take a swig of whiskey for courage and strength. There's a picture on the right-hand side of the god Shiva being poured his bong by his wife, Poverty. So, since we mentioned Iran, I want to kind of just talk about it a little bit, because in the olden days, it was known as Persia. And the early settlers of Persia, they also were the Aryans, um, and they, again, blonde, blue eyes from northern Russia and eastern Russia. But the Persians created their own religion called Zoroastrianism. And in their holy book, the prophet Zoroaster proclaimed that Banga, which is similar to Indian Bang, would reveal the spiritual world's mysteries to those who consumed it. Now, you know, you have to jump 1,200 years and the vast ma majority of people who live in Iran are now Muslim and they are Shiite Muslims. So it has transcended and changed a lot. But you do still see some Zoroastrians living in India and there's a small population still in Iran today. And again, you know, when it's incorporated into a religious ritual, it becomes very institutionalized and very legitimized. Then we have the Scythians. Around the 7th century BCE, Aryan warriors, again those Aryans, named the Scythians, came out of central Siberia to claim a vast territory stretching from northern Greece and beyond the Black Sea to the Altai Mountains in central Siberia as their new homeland. Much like their ancestors who settled in India and Persia, the Scythians were no strangers to the intoxicating effects of marijuana. So, some takeaways right now, just as a moment. We see that the vast majority of people who live in India, in Iran, and now the Scythians, which really, if you think of northern Greece, all came out of this really cold area in northern Russia. And they all came south because it was warmer and better. But they all brought with them this understanding that this plant had many, many uses. This is how things are learned and shared, is when new settlers move to an area, they're always going to bring their own customs. So we should welcome them and not be afraid of them, unless they take us over. According to Herodotus, a Greek historian who lived in the 5th century BCE, marijuana was an integral part of the Scythian cult of the dead. Marijuana was also used in funeral rites for the Scythians. After the bodies were prepared, the Scythians crawled into small tents and dumped marijuana seeds onto the red-hot stones. In the words of Herodotus, the vapors from the seeds caused the Scythians to howl with joy.
Hmm. So there you see where Scythia was. And um, again, like I said, now it's really more part of Greece than anything else. And there on the right hand side, you'll see another representation uh, with the cannabis leaf prominently displayed. So whatever happened to the Scythians, because we sure know what happened in Iran and India, well, the Scythians eventually disappeared as a distinct national entity, but their descendants spread through Eastern Europe. Interestingly, on Christmas Eve, the people of Poland and Lithuania serve semenitaka, a soup made from hemp seeds. And I know I ruined that pronunciation, but and I've been practicing, it just won't come out right. The Poles and Lithuanians believe that on the night before Christmas, the spirits of the dead visit the families, and the soup is for the souls of the dead. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? Moving on to the ancient Greeks. Now, when we think of the ancient Greeks, most of us think about 5600 BCE. So that's a good idea to think of. A Greek poet named Homer created the Iliad, one of the first great works of Western civilization, and it contains what is considered one of the first references to cannabis in Greek literature. Just to make a clarification, Homer was not writing this stuff down. He was a bard, somebody who would tell the stories. And it's like today when you go to a concert and you listen to the music of your favorite band. In those days, storytellers would travel from town to town and share their great stories. Now, Homer is probably one of many poets who went around telling these stories, but Homer is getting the credit, so there you go. Homer references a power powder that, when added to wine, brings about a euphoric feeling, and again, that's mentioned in the Iliad. The story describes a time where a woman named Helen and her party guests were sad over a lost hero. The more they talked, the sadder they became, until Helen used a drug Homer called Nepenthe, in English that's again sorrow, to suppress despair. Whoever drank this mixture, Homer wrote, would be incapable of sadness. So, sounds like cannabis, probably? Plutarch 46 to 127 BCE, writing 400 years later, mentions that after their meals it was not uncommon for the Thracians, which was a Greek community, so let me, to compare it, so if you think of the United States, you're going to have people from the south, you're going to have Californians, you're going to have New York people, you're going to have people from the Midwest. So Thracian was a community area in the same way. And Thracians like to throw the tops of plants on um, the fire, and it looked like oregano, according to Plutarch. You inhaled the fumes of this plant. The people became drunk and then so tired they finally fell asleep. And again, if we look at what they were throwing in there, it wasn't oregano. It was cannabis, and more importantly, it became a great way to get a good night's sleep. There were references to cannabis both as a delicacy and and a remedy for backache in Greek literature dating back to the 4th century BCE. Ancient Greece had oracles who made prophecies at the temples of various gods. So, if you had to read Oedipus Rex in high school, you will have heard of the Oracle of Delphi. The oracle prophet added laurel, grains, hemp, and cannabis on the hot ashes of a mound of burning charcoal and that created the fumes that the oracle would inhale to put her in a trance-like state. Hmm. Yes, we know what those trance states are like. The point is, is that again this ritualization, this putting it in as part of society legitimizes it in ways that we're beginning to see now in modern day uh, cannabis rights changing and, and becoming more a part of day-to-day -day life. 
So jumping ahead to the ancient Roman Empire, the Roman Empire was the largest of all the ancient empires, ranging from current day England to the eastern part of modern Russia. And this required a lot of warring, fighting, and healing. Pedasius Discordes is a man who became a physician in the early part of the first century AD and spent much of his early career in the Roman army tending the needs of the soldiers. During the campaigns, Pedasius recorded various plants he discovered and the first copy of this book was published in AD 70. Discordius called it the material medica and it became to the western world what the pen sao was to the Chinese. Discorides wrote that cannabis was not only a wonderful remedy for earaches but it quelled sexual desire and this is the first time that cannabis is mentioned in a western medical reference textbook. The Materia Medica became the primary herbal reference book for the next 1500 years like all the way into the 1600s. Claudius Galen was a 1st 2nd century physician in ancient Rome who also wrote a medical textbook. He noted that cannabis seeds were prevalent in certain desserts that were common among wealthy Romans who used to top off their banquets with a marijuana seed dessert, a confectionery treat, which left guests with a warm and pleasurable sensation. To be avoided, however, was an overindulgence in this confection, for among the adverse after-effects of too many seeds were dehydration and impotence. Oh, we don't like that. If you don't know what impotence is, it means when a man is unable to maintain or get an erection. Other properties Galen mentions are analgesic as well as being very effective in stopping flatulence. Flatulence, my friends, means farting or having gas. Most Romans, however, had very little familiarity with cannabis seeds. Very little hemp was raised in Italy and most of Rome's hemp came from Babylonia. Except in India and China, most of the western ancient world was completely ignorant of the intoxicating properties of the plant. Ancient European legends and herbals had little to say regarding its peculiar psychological effects. If Europeans saw any magic in cannabis, it was its fibers, not its intoxicating power, that they admired. Keeping in mind that at the time, the Roman Empire maxed out at a million people living in the city of Rome. And this is pre-technology. There was nothing going on but people living in a very tight part of the Italian countryside. So as you can see, you know, you're going to have your very rich who enjoyed it. The very poor didn't really know much about it other than that their clothes were probably made out of it. So why were the Europeans not partaking? Cannabis is best raised in hot, dry climates, which helps produce the resin or the THC. Most of Europe has either a mild or cold climate, so the plant that Europeans were most familiar with was hemp. This changed in the 1800s when hashish was imported to European countries from India and Arab countries. But that will be a conversation for a different day. But if you look over here on the map, you know, you see the boot, that's Italy. That's always a good way to kind of identify. Basically, everything north of Italy is cold, wet, and chilly. So the Mediterranean, Greece, Rome, further south, yes, that's where you saw the um, cannabis being grown, but it wasn't really that um, prevalent for the THC in the areas where it didn't grow well. Here are the works cited. Lots and lots of good sources out there. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask, email, text message me. If you're not in my class but still have a question, please leave a comment and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. Thank you and have a fabulous day.